Okay, here we go. Uh, lesson seven, Hitler's legal path to power. Or was it? Key questions that you're going to need to be able to answer are why did presidential government replace parliamentary government in 1930? What do we mean by presidential government? Why did two versions of presidential government attempted between 1930 and 1932 fail? How did Hitler turn limited power to absolute power in early 1933? And how did other political parties help Hitler into power? Finally, did Hitler come to power legally? So let's get on with it. Why did parliamentary government break down in 1930? Well, principally, it was because of disagreement between moderate parties about what to do with the Great Depression, the huge economic problems, the unemployment and so on. So at the time, uh, 1930, um, Germany was ruled by a coalition. Uh, Hermann Müller was the Chancellor, and it was a coalition of the Social Democrats, the German People's Party, the German Democratic Party, and the Catholic Centre Party, Zentrum. Now, this coalition of four parties broke down in 1930. Basically, they disagreed about what to do about the financial crisis. Well, the Catholic Centre Party, the Centre Party, the German Democratic Party and the German People's Party, they thought that cuts in spending were necessary. It was kind of economic theory at the time that managing a nation's finances was a bit like managing a person's finances. And if you were going deeply into debt, then the government needed to sort of save money and be thrifty. And so cuts in spending, it was hoped, would help revive the economy. Um, the Social Democrats were aware that cuts in spending would be very unpopular with their voter base who may well be benefiting from government spending. So, you know, the workers and so on, the Socialist Democrat Party support base of workers would not like to see cuts in spending on things like unemployment benefit and other schemes. So they opposed it. And as a consequence, the coalition broke up. Now, there was now a very significant event in the September 1930 election. In that election, the Social Democrats, the Centre Party, the People's Party and the Democratic Party, the total received by these major democratic parties, which had formed a coalition before, was only 48%. So even if these moderate parties that were in favour of democracy, even if they'd managed to come together, even then they wouldn't have been able to form a workable coalition. They no longer formed more than 50%. What you have now is a period of presidential government. Basically, there is no coalition formed within the Reichstag which can form a majority of more than 50%. What happens now is this. President Hindenburg, we know, is the president. <laughs> He's 83 years old. He's really old. I mean, he was even pulled out of retirement in World War I to fight on the Eastern Front. He is old. And he starts to rely increasingly on a circle of advisers. Principal among those and instrumental in the next sequence of events is a general, General Kurt von Schleicher. These circle of advisers, however, they are very, very right-wing and they are anti-democratic. So Hindenburg now is appointing chancellors. Now that's his right as president to appoint chancellors from the Reichstag. But none of the chancellors he appoints are going to be representatives of a party in a majority coalition. Any chancellor has basically, from any party, has, has little chance of getting enough support in the Reichstag for any laws that they want to propose. So what's going to happen is this. Any chancellor is going to need the support of President Hindenburg to push through laws using that emergency power under Article 48. No chancellor can count on support of the majority of the Reichstag. So any idea, any law they've got to get, they've got to go to Hindenburg. If he agrees with it, he'll push it through under Article 48. So you effectively get what are called the Article 48 chancellors. 
They're chancellors, but they're relying on the president to push legislation through using Article 48. So the first of these so-called Article 48 chancellors was Heinrich Brüning of the Catholic Centre Party. Now, you might be quite surprised, actually, that Hindenburg, a right-wing anti-democrat, and his circle of advisers, including Kurt von Schleicher, none of whom are friends of democracy, would invite a member of the Centre Party to be the Chancellor. There's a couple of reasons why. First of all, he was well known. They do require the support of the Reichstag as much as possible. Uh, he was a World War I cavalry officer, so that, that kind of guarantees him more of the support of the right-wing nationalists. They like his military credentials. He was a conservative monarchist. Again, the right-wing elements are going to be in favour of that. And he had a background in economics and finance, and it was hoped that Heinrich Brüning's background in economics would help him deal with the economic crisis facing the world, and in particular, Germany. Now, what were Heinrich Brüning's economic policies? Well, he went along with the orthodox, by which you mean sort of the prevalent thinking of the time. He, went, he was an orthodox economist. Again, sort of like thinking of personal finances, he thought of being thrifty, of prudent, of cuts in spending, that would help reduce by, by reducing government spending. This would help Germany get to get out of the economic problems it was in, uh, and so he, that's what he did. He, there were cuts in spending, cuts in unemployment benefit, cuts in public sector wages and pensions. There weren't any cuts significantly in the army's budget, nor were there any cuts in farming subsidies. Not surprising, really, because he needed Hindenburg to push through his policies, and Hindenburg. Uh, was you know a right winger. He 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 was a supporter of the Junkers, a supporter of the army. And Kurt von Schleicher of the army was an advisor. So no surprise that neither the army nor the farming subsidies. There were no cuts there. Um, he does succeed Bruning in getting reparations suspended in 1931 and even scrapped in 1932. You might think that was an incredible development, you know, that reparations, the hated reparations, are finally scrapped. But to be honest, in the context of the economic chaos of the Great Depression. It's not that significant. He becomes known as the Hunger Chancellor. There's obviously a lot of suffering in Germany. Unemployed people have had their unemployment benefit cut. There are a hell of a lot of them. And in fact, unemployment continues to rise. In 1932, it's reaching huge proportions. Six million unemployed. Well, why did Brüning lose office? Well, partly because of the failure of his economic policies. The, the communists were gaining in power, uh, especially among the disgruntled unemployed of the working class. And so his economic policy seemed to be encouraging a, a support for extremists. Um, within Germany, you've got the, the, the political chaos and the violence fighting between the communists' uh, Red Front Fighters League and the, the SA of the Nazis. You've got street violence. Uh, this enhances middle class fears of a communist takeover. Kurt von Schleicher now starts to see perhaps that Brüning has had his day. Um, another thing that turns Hindenburg off Brüning, uh, makes him fall out of love with Brüning, is that Heinrich Brüning, um, Hindenburg was hoping that he would smooth in 1932 uh, Hindenburg onto another seven year term without the need for election, which Brüning doesn't do. And the 1932 election is really something of an embarrassment for Hindenburg because Hitler does really well. Yes, he loses, but he gets 13 million votes. That's a very significant vote as opposed to Hindenburg's 19 million. And what's kind of embarrassing for Hindenburg is the only reason he actually wins that election is he actually is getting support from the left wing, from the Social Democrats, who are afraid of Hitler getting power. And the right-wingers that he would hope to vote for him are largely voting for Hitler. So it's really an embarrassment. Um, he dislikes uh, Brüning over that, over the failure to sort of smooth his passage to become president. But the real nail in the coffin for Brüning is an idea that he comes up with to confiscate Juncker estates in Prussia and to maybe settle unemployed Germans on those estates. There's absolutely no way Hindenburg and his conservative right-wing supporters, including Juncker supporters, are going to support that. And that's really the nail in the coffin for Brüning. He's out of power. Schleicher, again, he's still one of the significant advisors to Hindenburg, and he persuades him to appoint a guy called Franz von Papen. 
Let's have a look at Franz von Papen now as Chancellor. Little known, no experience, not really very well respected by many of those he met, not respected in terms of his intellect, but he was a hard line right winger, very nationalistic. Now, Schleicher, again, he's kind of like the spider behind the scenes manipulating events here. He is authoritarian, he does want to sideline the Reichstag. Uh, he wants to move towards a more authoritarian presidential form of government, which Franz von Papen wants as well. But in order to do that, they still need the support of the Reichstag for any chancellor they've got there. Now, they, it's difficult to get that because of the disunity within the Reichstag. So, Schleicher realises, you know, he needs the support of the Nazis that, you need, that you know, in order to, to get support for the chancellor. Uh, and get some measure of stability back into the government. So he does a number of things, Schleicher and Papen do a number of things which they hope will gain the support of the Nazis. The first thing that is appointed is the so-called Cabinet of Barons. These are all very right-wing, very reactionary, and it's hoped that this will appeal to the Nazis, this very right-wing conservative cabinet, including people like Alfred von Hugenberg. Something else which is done with the Nazis in mind is the ban on the SA is lifted. It's clearly very beneficial to the Nazis. And it's hoped that this is going to get Nazi support for Franz von Papen as Chancellor. Uh, something else that Schleicher and Papen do, again hoping to get the support of the Nazis as they call new elections, knowing that the Nazis are probably going to do well in those. Uh, something uh, which is an event now which which von Papen does, which is a sinister sort of milestone in the gradual dismantling of democracy during this time, is he actually removes the social democrat government controlled government of Prussia. This is done with, with very little sort of protest, surprisingly. Let's look at the political intrigues now between 1932 and 1933, which result eventually in Hitler being appointed Chancellor. Well, after the July 32 elections, Hitler is insisting that as the leader of the largest party in the Reichstag, he should be made Chancellor. July 32, they've got 38% of the vote. They're the largest party. So Hitler meets with Schleicher, with von Papen and von Hindenburg, and he demands that he be made Chancellor. Hindenburg doesn't like the idea at all. He's quite snobbish. He doesn't like Hitler's lowly origins. He, in fact, calls him the little bohemian corporal. So these meetings take place throughout August, and Hindenburg rejects Hitler as chancellor. But there are now some results. There's a fallout of these August meetings. The first of them is that the Nazis now join with the communists, surprisingly, their arch enemies, in a vote of no confidence in the government of Papen. So Papen can clearly no longer remain in power as chancellor. In the November 1932 elections that take place, and although they lose votes, the Nazis remain at the largest party in the Reichstag. Schleicher realises now that, you know, the Nazis aren't going to get behind Papen. He even says, somewhat condescendingly, it shows his view of Papen, little Franz has served his purpose. So he does want a, a Chancellor who is going to get some measure of support from the Reichstag in order to avoid this chaos of, of continual changes of Chancellor. So he has his next little brainwave. He makes himself Chancellor in December 1932. Well, that annoys um, von Papen that he's been booted out. Schleicher's hoping that he can get the Nazis behind him. He doesn't have any real backing within the Reichstag. And he actually has a plan which turns out to be, really, I guess, somewhat naive. It's certainly not going to work. His idea is he's going to persuade the, the left wing of the Nazi party, which he believes exists, the more socialist Nazis, to merge with the social democrats who are trade unionists, b believing that they both have a sort of left wing socialist agenda. And if he can get them behind him, he can continue as chancellor. Well, this is far fetched. Uh, so he approaches Gregor Strasser. Uh, to try and get enlist the, the support of the so-called left wing of the Nazi party. But there's no way social democrats who are in favour of, you know, equality, um, democracy, right, you know, r civil rights, there's no way they're going to ally with the Nazi bully boys at all. So this just falls through completely. It's not going to happen. So what happens next? 
is in January 1933. Hitler is appointed Chancellor. Well, how does that happen? Five times, um, Papen meets with Hindenburg and other sort of big business interests are there as well. And he's trying to persuade uh, Hindenburg to make Hitler Chancellor with Papen as a Vice Chancellor. And this eventually happens. Well, why do the three interested parties here, why do they agree to this? Why do they agree to Hitler becoming Chancellor? Well, Hitler himself is he's under pressure after the November setback. Remember, the Nazi vote has declined, and part of that is that the voters are kind of annoyed that they're giving him a large share of the vote, but he just simply seems to be refusing to cooperate. Uh, and, and form a meaningful part in the government. He's under pressure from people in the Nazi party as well. So again, uh, being appointed chancellor is not too bad, even though the majority of the members of the cabinet are not Nazi. Um, he also wants to punish Schleicher for trying to um, split the Nazi party and get the left wing behind him, so he's seeking to punish Schleicher. Why does Hindenburg change his tune? Well, it looks like it's, Hitler's the only viable option. He's the only person that's going to get any level of support in the Reichstag, of course, because he controls the largest party, the Nazis. Um, he did want his friend von Papen back in government. He'd formed quite a close personal relationship with von Papen and wanted him back in government. And he believed Papen's assurances that Hitler could be controlled. After all, although he was Chancellor, the Nazis would form a minority of the cabinet. It's probably uh, as fair to say at the time that uh, Hindenburg, at the age of 83, was becoming somewhat enfeebled and senile. Why did Papen want himself to be vice-chancellor under Hitler as a chancellor? Well, he was deeply ambitious. He clearly couldn't be chancellor. He'd lost the uh, vote of no confidence on that score. But at least he could play a significant role in the government. Uh, he was confident that he could control Hitler, that he and the other arch-conservatives could manage Hitler. And he also wanted his revenge on Schleicher for pushing him out of office. Let's have a look at the next sort of roll call of events leading up to the Hitler essentially becoming almost dictator. So, he is, in January 1933, a chancellor, not a dictator. He's still effectively just another Article 48 chancellor, relying on Hindenburg to push through his agenda. Out of the coalition government, only three out of the twelve are Nazis. He needed a two-thirds majority if he was going to enact a major constitutional change which would grant him much more dictatorial powers and enable him to realise his ambition of becoming Fuhrer of Germany. So, the, the, the Nazis undertook quite a lot of steps. The SA increased their level of intimidation and beatings throughout Germany. Some opposition newspapers were banned, but a significant event in February of 1933 was the Reichstag fire. Well, we don't have any hard and fast evidence who started it, but we certainly know who benefited from it, and it was the Nazis. So the German parliament, the Reichstag, burned down. The Nazis cried foul. This uh, young guy was arrested, Marinus van der Lubbe, who had um, a, a links to the, uh, the Communist Party, and the, the Nazis screamed about the possibility of a communist uprising. They persuaded, Hitler persuaded Hindenburg to pass a law, the decree for the protection of people and state. Now, this law was significant because it suspended the basic rights which were guaranteed in the 19 constitutions, such as freedom of speech, and freedom of assembly. And the Nazis used it to ban the KPD, to ban the Communist Party. So another step towards dictatorship, although not quite there yet. In the March 1933 elections, after the banning of the Communists, the Nazis now get 44% of the vote. But this is done, this, this election is in the background of intimidation, fear, the Communists have been banned, many leading Communists have been arrested. Um, it's, in, it's, it's taken in a tough climate of fear. Let's look now at the Enabling Act, which does provide a, a legal basis for Hitler's dictatorship. Basically, the Nazis had 44% of the vote after the March 33 election. They now formed an alliance with the DNVP, with the German Nationalists. They agreed to support uh, the Nazis in a vote for an Enabling Act, which would effectively grant Hitler dictatorial powers. Now, because the KPD had been outlawed, their 81 seats were taken out of the equation. So, the, with the 44% they initially had, 
added to the votes of the DNVP, and with the Communist Party seats being uh, basically discounted as the KPD had been banned, the Nazis now had 60% of the vote. They needed two-thirds, remember, to pass a major piece of legislation like the Enabling Act, which would grant Hitler virtual dictatorial powers. Well, he wanted absolute power, he needed an amendment to the 1919 Constitution, and that was an Enabling Act. That's what he was after. That would allow him to create new laws. And if you can make new laws, you're effectively a dictator. He could make new laws, hopefully with this Enabling Act, well, hopefully for him, without the support of Hindenburg. He wouldn't need Hindenburg's Article 48, nor would he need the normal route to power or the normal route to making new laws, which was through the Reichstag. An Enabling Act would allow him to bypass both the President and the Reichstag and give him dictatorial powers. Well, there's no way the Social Democrats were going to vote for a law like that. Who did? The Catholic Centre Party. For reasons which we'll discuss later, he does get the support of the Catholic Centre Party. The Enabling Act is now passed by 444 votes to 94 votes in the Kroll Opera House in a real atmosphere of fear and intimidation. And courageously, the 94 Social Democrats vote against the Enabling Act. Most of those are going to be arrested and sent to concentration camps. This is effectively the death of democracy in Germany, the Enabling Act. Well, let's just have a look now. How, in what ways did sort of the other political powers, parties, help Hitler into power? Let's begin with the conservative elites, the parties like the DNVP, the German Nationalist Party. Well, they really opened the way for Hitler. They were certainly closer in outlook in many respects. They were willing to do business with Hitler. You look at arch-conservative figures like Alfred Hugenberg of the Nationalist Party. He, he cooperated with Hitler over the Young Plan. Look at Kurt von Schleicher of the German army, Franz von Papen, an archwing nationalist. These are all, they're doing deals with the devil. The German Nationalist Party eventually forms a coalition with Hitler, allowing him uh, to pass the Enabling Act. The army, senior figures in the army and big business get behind him and help persuade Hindenburg uh, to appoint Hitler. Not all, there are senior uh, military figures and, many, and, and some in big business who are opposed to the Nazis, but a significant number do, and that helps him. Helps him in terms of cash donations as well to the Nazi party from several pe uh, people in big business who see potential profits to be made, and like uh, the Nazis are fiercely anti-communist. So, how did the left-wing parties unwittingly let their arch enemy into power? How did they allow it? How did they enable it? Well, both the Social Democrats and the Communists are absolute enemies of Communism, but they're also enemies of each other. In fact, you know, if you remember right back to the use of the Free Corps uh, to suppress the KPD back in 1923, the KPD uh, view the Social Democrats as, as, as bad, or if not worse, than the Nazis, perversely. They call them Social Fascists. They say, actually say they're a bigger danger than the Nazis. The, both the Social Democrats and the Communists, they're perhaps blind to the Nazi menace. In some ways, the Social Democrats themselves provide one of the first stepping stones towards the Nazis taking power. Way back in 1930, they caused the breakup of the coalition between themselves and the other moderate parties by not agreeing to spending put cuts because they were afraid of losing support from their working class supporter base. So in some ways, perhaps they unwittingly set the ball in motion. Furthermore, the communists definitely uh, were an enabling factor. The, the street violence of the Red Front Fighters League gave somebody for the SA to fight in the streets, uh, fueled fears of communism, especially in the middle class and the upper class within Germany, and it did have direct links to Soviet Russia, direct which were known about and feared by many within Germany. It did help force the middle class, many of them, if you remember the voting patterns that you saw previously, many of them did drift into the Nazi fold. The Catholic Centre Party, now, the Catholics themselves, we've seen, did not vote in any meaningful numbers for the Nazis. There was no widespread support for the Nazi party amongst ordinary voting Catholics. But the leaders of the Catholics in the Centre Party were willing to form that coalition, and they voted for the Enabling Act as well. Now, 
Why did they do that? They thought perhaps they could influence Hitler and they thought this would protect the Catholic Church, ensure that a future government dominated by the Nazis would not interfere with the Catholic Church in a way that they've experienced before, for example, with the Kulturkampf, the, the cultural struggle beforehand. They hoped, uh, to be fair as well to the, to the Catholic Centre Party, that they were no fans of Hitler, and by this stage, the, 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 the momentum was on Hitler's side. The bullying, the violence, the intimidation, there's little chance that he could have been stopped at this stage anyway. The middle class parties, in some way, they could share some of the blame as well. The vote for the, the, the middle class parties declined drastically uh, and left them essentially powerless to oppose the, 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 the Nazis. But they, they also didn't really stand up and fight for democracy as well. They didn't take a, a more courageous and outspoken stand against the Nazis. So, last question, did Hitler come to power legally? Well, in some ways, yes. He, the amendments to the 1919 Constitution, which paved the way for him assuming virtual dictatorial powers, were legal. He was appointed Chancellor by Hindenburg. This was not extra legal. This was a legal appointment, even though you know, he didn't have a majority. The Reichstag Fire Decree was legal under Article 48. Uh, the Enabling Act was, in some ways, a legal act. He did have the two-thirds majority that he needed with the support of the German Nationalists and the Catholic Centre Party. Yet, in other ways, it was clearly not legal. It was done through violence, uh, through intimidation, through bullying tactics. Street violence played a large part in driving away uh, the, the power of the communists and the trade unions and so, uh, that the Nazi terror that came after Hitler's appointment at Chancellor certainly had no legal basis. Uh, he, he called um, Nazi thugs that had beaten up and even murdered political opponents nationalist freedom fighters. This is not the actions of somebody who supports legality. This is the actions of, you know, extra legal, violent, bullying, terrorist means. So I hope you've made uh, some notes there and we'll discuss this stuff in class.